The next item of business is a debate on motion 9406 in the name of Fergus Ewing on sea fisheries and end year negotiations. May I ask those who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Fergus Ewing to speak to and move the motion for up to 13 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, I'm pleased to open this, our annual fisheries debate, by welcoming the broad consensus across this Parliament in support of the motion. We go into the year-end talks with an industry and a sector in rude health. The mood on the key side right now is positive, and rightly so, with a 25% increase in the real-term value of landings in 2016 to £557 million. So we must focus on the current needs and interests of the industry, the onshore sector, our coastal communities and marine environment, and build on that success to ensure a good year of sustainable fishing in 2018. Will the, the Cabinet Secretary take an intervention? Uh, yes, certainly. Stuart Stevenson. I, I understand uh, a number of the uh, smaller boats uh, that fish in shore are worried about the increasing uh, costs of licences. Um, is the Scottish Government uh, aware of this and uh, is there any way we can tackle this? Fergus Ewing. Uh, yes, that, that issue has been raised with me on a number of occasions and uh, in visiting various, uh, uh, various of uh, the smaller fishermen. And uh, I am recommending therefore that with immediate effect we shall make shellfish entitlements detachable from parent licenses i'm saying also this will allow smaller vessels who need this entitlement to get access to licenses and shellfish entitlements without directly competing against for example a big pelagic skipper and i believe that this is of particular importance uh, to local inshore vessels and i know that it has been raised by the western isles by, by a, fisher, a fisherman in the Western Isles, Clyde, Orkney and Fife, and I hope will be warmly welcomed by those fishermen. Um, carry, carrying on, presiding officer, there, there are, of course, dark Brexit clouds on the horizon, and I'm not going to focus too much on the politics of, of this today, if I may, but rather on uh, the work that we're doing to get the best possible deal for Scottish fishermen. But I do welcome the liberal amendments in that regard, acknowledging the uncertainty caused by the prospect and the risk of Brexit for the sector, both offshore and onshore. But turning to the task in hand, we now have the full set of scientific advice from ICES, the scientific advice which, as usual, shows mixed fortunes. The advice for whitefish in the North Sea is broadly encouraging, with advised increases for a range of stocks, including cod, haddock, whiting, saith and monkfish. There is also positive advice for North Sea prawns. However, the West Coast remains more difficult, with the fortunes of cod and whiting remaining challenging and a cut advised for West Coast prawns. For pelagic stocks, the science advises increases for blue whiting and North Sea herring, but decreases for mackerel and atlanto scandian herring, known as ash. One of this government's key negotiating principles is to follow best scientific advice. Respecting such advice enables us to make decisions and secure outcomes that are responsible, credible and objective with sustainability at heart. Uh, this commitment to sustainability and responsible management is one of the reasons we do need to press forward uh, with effective measures to tackle discards. The Scottish Government remains committed to the ambitious principles behind the landing obligation, namely to reduce waste, to improve accountability and to safeguard the sustainability of fishing stocks. 2018 will see the final year of phasing and the full discard ban will take effect from 2019. And to this end, we must endeavour to tackle the issue of choke species. It's essential that the livelihoods of our fishermen are protected. I'm absolutely clear that I could not accept any situation in which our fleet is unnecessarily tied to the quayside when there is still quota available to fish. But there has not yet been sufficient progress at a European level. Existing tools by themselves, which I support the full use of, will not result in a total solution to choke species in some areas. So we must urgently explore other solutions. For example, to avoid choke risk, quota distribution must more accurately reflect the distribution and abundance of fish likely to be encountered on the grounds. North Sea Hake is a perfect example of this type of mismatch whose distribution has shifted 
since current quota shares between member states were fixed. These, presiding officer, and other tools will be discussed at the forthcoming Brussels negotiations, and I shall be making these points forcibly. This year's talks are... It certainly, yes. Mark Ruskell. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary uh, for giving way? Would the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge that remote electronic monitoring is an important part of the toolbox we've got? Fergus Ewing. Yes, there, there are many tools, and I accept that uh, monitoring and the use of TVs and so on is uh, increasingly part of, uh, uh, part of the overall approach to sustainable fishing, uh, and of course, therefore, it, it is appropriate in some cases. This year's talks are now well underway and have already delivered some strong results, including at the coastal states and EU-Norway talks, which together deliver more in economic terms than December Council. At the October coastal states talks for Macro, our single most valuable stock, our officials were key in influencing the shape of a new long-term management strategy for the stock. This saw fishing levels aligned with the principles of maximum sustainable yield and constrained the reduction in catching opportunities to 20% in 2018, worth around £130 million to the Scottish industry. Coastal states talks on blue whiting and ash continue in Copenhagen and we are working hard to secure agreement, hopefully today, on a full five-party deal that will deliver sustainable and sensible fishing levels for the coming year. Last week's negotiations between the EU and Norway delivered increased catching opportunities for five of the six North Sea stocks that are jointly managed with Norway, with four of these six stocks now being fished at sustainable levels. We also successfully secured a strong additional package of inward North Sea quota transfers from Norway, aligned with priorities identified by our industry. This included increased tonnages of whiting, uh, Norway, uh, others, and Norwegian monkfish uh, compared to last year. For North Sea whiting, the combined effect of a 38% increase on the TAC, combined with an additional inward transfer from Norway of 800 tonnes, will give a significant uh, increase in quota for whiting stocks. As such, presiding officer, there can now be absolutely no rationale for the UK government to continue to top slice Scottish whiting quota for the sole benefit of English vessels, and I expect this to cease immediately. Of course, by their very definition, negotiations involve compromises, so there will inevitably be areas where we are unsuccessful in fully achieving our aims at the EU-Norway talks. EU negotiators have continued to trade away safe quota in both the North Sea and the West of Scotland. This is a significant choke risk stock for Scotland and the North Sea, and we remain firmly opposed in principle to giving away to Norway stocks that we remain short of ourselves. This makes neither economic nor fishing sense and risks putting the industry in a difficult position under the landing obligation. Furthermore, the EU has again retained an over-reliance on the use of North, northern blue whiting as a currency with which to bring in Arctic cod quota from Norway. Within the EU bloc, the UK is the largest shareholder of blue whiting, of which Scotland holds over 92%. Yet, we do not receive a single tonne of the Arctic cod coming back in return. Despite these disappointments, I consider that on balance, the incoming package of North Sea opportunities was stronger than last year and signalled a sufficient enough shift in the dynamics of the exchange with Norway to allow me to accept the deal on the table. The EU FARO talks are currently underway. Uh, I know they're of particular importance to fishermen in Shetland. This agreement provides essential quota and access opportunities to Faroese waters for our whitefish fleet worth around £2 million. In return, Faroese vessels may fish a range of quota including mackerel in our waters. Whilst I accept this, I have previously made clear that I cannot accept how the level of Faroese access was fixed in 2014 via a private deal done by the Commission without any consultation with Member States. Uh, and Members, uh, obviously, in fishing constituencies, uh, are, are only too well aware of that uh, unfairness. I therefore welcome the significant step forward at last year's talks, which put this issue back on the negotiating table. Now, whilst I recognise that delivering a reduction from the current 30% access level is going to be very challenging, my officials will continue to pursue this goal during this week's talks. Presenting officer, next week I and my officials will attend December Council to conclude this year's negotiations 
where quotas for stocks fished solely by the EU fleet will be set. Today, I seek input and views across the Chamber, as well as support for our approach. My focus at the Council will be to champion the interests of the industry and ensure that Scotland's interests are fully represented by the UK in discussions. In general terms, the best possible outcome entails ensuring that scientific advice is realised as quota and resisting cuts which are not supported by scientific evidence. I will also seek to secure appropriate quota uplifts to support continued implementation of the landing obligation. That includes seeking action on West of Scotland Cod to provide the fleet with additional benefit while solutions are developed for resolving this significant choke risk. I will pursue additional inter-area flexibility arrangements that allow the fleet to move quota between different sea areas to address choke risks. Uh, Scottish industry will, as normal, be well represented at Council and I will discuss progress with them on a regular basis. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, the autumn negotiations are complex but vital and Scottish Government officials are very well respected and listened to for the expertise and knowledge they bring to the process. I myself saw that when attending uh, as the head of the Scottish delegation last year in those talks in Brussels. And indeed, my recollection was that uh, so proficient and respected and efficacious were the representations made uh, a, with the excellent assistance of uh, my officials that we achieved uh, a quite extraordinary 24 out of our 26 negotiating aims, something that was welcomed by the industry. However, what is straightforward is that the industry and myself working closely together uh, shall work tirelessly to deploy all options available to us and deliver the best possible outcomes for our fishing interests and indeed our marine environment, enabling our industry, communities and economy to benefit from continued sustainable growth in 2018. I move the motion in my name. I call Peter Chapman to speak to and move Amendment 9406.2. Uh, up to eight minutes, please, Mr Chapman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I am glad to be leading off this debate for the Scottish Conservatives today. And since the Brexit vote in June 2016, the fishing industry has been extremely positive about the challenges and the opportunities they face. It has been a pleasure to work with them over the past year, and it is a privilege to speak on their behalf in this debate today. The past 18 months have been good for our fishermen. Landings are up and prices are good. There are record numbers of new boats being built and the mood is buoyant. Peterhead Port has invested over 50 million pounds in the last year, deepening the harbour and building a new, bigger fish market. Market. Likewise, there has been considerable investment in harbour facilities in Shetland to facilitate increased landings there. However, the fish processing sector has seen a decrease in capacity and from 2008 to 2016 there has been a 34% decline in processing capacity in North East Scotland. We are losing business and jobs to Humberside where fish processing is growing. We appear to be uncompetitive due in, in large measure, I would argue, to large increases in business rates. We need to reverse this trend to handle the extra fish which Brexit will bring. Now, cod are a great example of how stocks have improved over the last 10 years. In 2006, Scottish cod stocks had fallen to 44,000 tonnes from a high of 270,000 tonnes in the 1970s. But through a combined effort by our fishermen, and using innovative technology and gear and restricting our fishing effort, our cod stocks rose to a level of 149,000 tonnes last year. Good news, and a step towards a long and prosperous future. Now, if anyone mistakenly thinks that the EU or the CFP can take credit for any of this increase, just take a look at the dire state of fish stocks in the Mediterranean and the Adriatic Seas. Good stocks saw last week's bipartite EU Norway talks award increased quotas for five out of the six North Sea stocks. And this included increases of 38% for whiting, 25% for herring, 24% for haddock, and 10% for cod. And although these increases have been agreed, 
It is at the annual Council of Fisheries Ministers talks, which take place next week, where e EU member states divide up fishing quotas for the year ahead. And although there has been an increase in stocks, there are serious concerns with regards to choke species. Without major up uplifts in the quotas for cod and hake, for instance, in next week's meeting, there is a real fear industry-wide that landing obligations will lead to restrictions on fishing. If, and I, I argue that if these problems occur, the government must, government must be prepared to act beyond the existing tools of Article 15 of the basic regulation. And this has already happened with DAB and flounder being removed from total TACs and the quota regulation. It is important that we recognize today that the upcoming end year negotiations will be the last negotiations in which the UK is awarded quotas from the EU for a full year. As in April 2019, the UK will cease its membership of the EU and will be out of the CFP. We all know the fishing industry overwhelmingly voted to leave the EU as membership of it and the CFP has been little short of disastrous. The UK only catches 40% of the fish zonally attached to our EEZ. Norway catches 80%, as Iceland catches 90%. So this shows the size of the prize which is up for grabs. And we can and we must start to redress this unfair situation. We must listen to the industry and we should consider a nine month bridging arrangement. The industry does not want and we do not need a two year transition period for fishing. This time next year at the Council of Ministers talks, the UK will be in a unique position the negotiation must recognize that three months on from the December 2018 talks in March 2019, we will be out of the CFP and an independent coastal state with control of and responsibility for our EEZ out to 200 miles. Therefore, we must start to redress the balance of the quota shares at that point, that's December 2018, and then allow those agreed shares to run from March for the next nine months until December 2019, when the UK takes its place at the top table alongside Norway, Iceland, the Faroes, and the EU. Now, this is the nine month bridge the industry is arguing for, and which I hope the Cabinet Secretary will get behind. Once the UK has achieved coastal state status, the UK can then make clear its intention to seek adjustment to existing fixed shares. The UK would work with others to create new fixed shares based on objective criteria, with zonal attachment being the fairest indicator. Absolutely. Stuart Stevenson. Is the member telling us that uh, we can only retrieve those parts of the fishery out to 200 miles that are uh, done by other states with their permission because he seems to be indicating that rather than as the fishing industry tells me it expects on the day we leave the CFP we control a hundred percent of the fishing out to 200 miles he's suggesting that the rights of uh, those who currently fish in our waters will continue that's what I heard Peter Chapman well it's not what I said we will control the fish out to the 200 miles. That is quite correct. But we will also work with our partners. Nobody's saying that on day one, on March the 19th, the, the, uh, the shutters will come down and another, another boat will never f fish in our seas. Nobody's ever said that. So, with zonal attachment being the fairest indicator, an Aberdeen University study suggests that significant gains for Scotland based on zonal attachment can be delivered for key com commercial species. Now, this is a model that the SFF is working to achieve, and I, I, I believe it is being closely studied at Westminster as well. It has merit, it is pragmatic, and it is a fair way forward, because we must work collaboratively with, collaboratively with our EU neighbours, who would continue to have access to our waters but with lower catching levels, 
They would operate under our controls and our rules and regulations, just as happens right now when our boats fish in Norwegian waters. What we must not do is swap access to our, our seas for access to EU markets. The other big prize, once we leave the EU, will, will be our ability to set the rules and regulations governing our fleet. We need a regime which is fair, sustainable in the long term, respects the environment, and keeps our fishermen fishing. And I believe we can design a better way to manage our fish stocks. Presenting officer, this is an important debate. It has allowed me to outline a possible way through the Brexit negotiations for our fishing industry. We can deliver a vibrant future for our fishing industry and our towns and villages around the coast, which are dependent on fish for their future prosperity. We aim to realize the sea of opportunity that is within our grasp. And one last thought, if you'll permit me, presiding officer. For the last 40 years, oil has been a huge boost to the economy of the northeast of Scotland. But we must never forget that fishing and farming was the mainstay of the northeast economy long before oil was discovered. And both these primary industries will still be important long after the last drop of oil has been pumped from the North Sea. Presiding officer, I move the amendment in my name. I call Tavish Scott to speak to you and move amendment 9406.1. Seven minutes around, please. Thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. I feel a, a sense of uh, the end of an era. Some of us have been here, Lewis MacDonald and one or two others from, indeed, Fergus Ewing, from the early days of these uh, fishing debates. And it's one of those moments when we might wonder whether we'll pine for the language, presiding officer, of the common fisheries policy, the common access to a common resource, relative stability, or indeed the Hague preference. I seem to recall Mr Finney being asked by Mr Salmon at that very first fishing debate whether he'd invoke the Hague preference and as Ross Finney said to us afterwards, he knew that question was going to be asked, so he went away and did his homework before the debate to find out what the heck the Hague preference was. But hell, heaven help any fisheries minister who doesn't know what the Hague preference is. Uh, but in future, Mr Ewing, you may not need to know it because it may have no bearing on the, on the future whatsoever. It will all be gone. Whatever happens in future, the common fisheries policy uh, will be gone. It's never been common. Uh, it's never been a policy. It's not worked for fishing communities, not just here in Scotland, but right across the coastal states of the EU. On that, I entirely agree with uh, uh, Peter Chapman. But I first, I want to make really just two points today. The first is about the reality of the industry now. We're not really debating in detail the catch quotas set for monks, for haddock, or for cod. Uh, set at the recent EU-Norway annual negotiations. This is not a huge fight today about days at sea or indeed the discard ban. Yes, as uh, the Minister and uh, Peter Chapman have said, there are problems and Marine Scotland, of course, need to work with industry to sort those out and choke species is the main one of that. But nothing compares, uh, presiding officer, to the high drama and dark days of decommissioning and the financial losses by boats affecting families in every fishing community around the coast of Scotland. Broadly, as the Minister rightly said, stocks, science and fishing effort are in reasonable balance. The seas that we have responsibility for appear healthy. Science uh, says so. The second point I want to make is that the government want to double the size of the food and drink industry by 2030. And seafood will and has a significant role to play in that objective. Shetland's fish landings have grown from 300,000 boxes in 2015 to over 400,000 this year. 33 million pounds of white fish alone will be landed in the Isles this year. 21 containers of fresh seafood are on the boat every night from uh, Lerwick down to Aberdeen and on to market. And there are two issues there that I'd ask the Cabinet Secretary uh, to consider. Firstly, uh, ensuring there is enough shipping capacity as the industry landings grow. If Shetland, Shetland cannot get fish uh, on the boat, then we can't play our part in meeting the government's export target. And secondly, uh, conclude the ferry freight fares review. Uh, putting up freight charge charges by 2.9%, as the government have done, is not helping the industry's competitiveness, nor is it consistent with other government policies, notably the food and drink strategy. Now, I know Seafood Shetland have written to the Cabinet Secretary this week, and they would greatly appreciate his assistance on those matters. But to export and expand, to genuinely harvest the sea of opportunity, means access to market. And that, presiding officer, is the reason for my amendment this afternoon. Bertie Armstrong's uh, Scottish Fishermen's Federation briefing paper today is accurate in many respects. Bertie writes that with trade talks imminent, we must achieve the best and most free access to all markets, including the EU, including 
the EU. And that is absolutely right, presiding officer. Much of Shetland's catch, indeed much of the catch in the ports of Scotland, is destined for the European market. We can argue, of course, about weight, volume, the value of the statistics that go with that, but fishing depends on selling fish to Europe. Europeans eat simply more fish than we do. So we need a deal out of Brexit that makes sense not just for the car industry or financial services, but for fishing too. And yet this week, as we debate this industry, we find out two facts. Firstly, on trade, the UK cabinet has not even discussed the shape of a trade deal it wants to achieve. And secondly, no impact assessment of fishing, never mind the rest of the economy, has been carried out. That is a dereliction of duty by any government. And yet we are almost in 2018. We are months away from the UK government's timetable of leaving the EU in March 2019. And yet the UK cabinet has not discussed trade, nor do we know what any of this would actually mean for our economy. So the message for our industry is simply clear. Do not depend on the UK government to defend your interests. Sadly, the only party they are defending is the DUP. And that is because the DUP are keeping the Tories in office, in office, presiding officer, but not, sadly, in power. And the other reason I worry for fishing is this. The speech the UK Fisheries Minister Michael Gove, a member of the UK Cabinet, and a leading Brexiteer gave to a meeting of Danish fishermen on the 31st of July. As reported by the Financial Times, he assured the Danish food industry that their fishermen would, and I quote, still be able to catch large amounts in UK seas. So if ever there was an illustration of the need for our industry to be on our guard, it was this. Gove is a highly intelligent individual. He did not misspeak. He meant it. What he was really saying is that the fishing industry is part of the overall negotiations. It does not stand outside those negotiations. And as many old hands on the quay side from Lerwick to Anstruther remember, what happened in the 70s when the Tories went into Europe? So I therefore urge my good friends in the Scottish Fishermen's Federation and at home in the Shetland Fishermen's Association to hold the UK government's feet very firmly to the fire. Mr Gove has opened up what many of us feared on day one of Brexit, a Danish or a Dutch veto of the fishing part of Brexit in their own national interests. Not just the UK that has national interests, the Dutch and the Danes in fishing most certainly do too. The industry is highly significant in economic terms to both countries, just as in Ireland, who are currently holding a veto over number 10, and rightly so, it is all too easy to envisage the same from the Danes or the Dutch over access to UK parts of the North Sea. Now, I believe the SFF's advocacy of a nine-month bridge after March 29, 2019 rather, makes sense. It makes intellectual sense. It's the question is whether it makes political sense. It is a way forward. It certainly is. But it will need support as part of those Brexit negotiations. It will need support here and in London. As an, and as an approach to the future management of our seas, it will need to be sensibly explained to other coastal states and the EU. Now, who, presiding officer, is doing that? I rather doubt it's got to the top of David Davis's inbox, and Michael Gove seems more interested in being Chancellor than Fisheries Secretary. So this is a tough period in assessing the next steps. But Bertie Armstrong and the SFF are quite right to set out a plan across a nautical chart. It is now a question of how that chart is navigated across a very stormy political sea. And in that spirit, I move the amendment in my name. I now call Rhoda Grant, seven minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this debate is an annual event ahead of the fisheries negotiations with the European Union. The Norwegian talks have concluded, that concluded at the weekend have been reasonably successful, and this augurs well for the forthcoming talks with the EU. It's also a good backdrop to the talks that the fishing industry itself is doing well. Fish stocks have recovered, and there's plenty fish to catch. Fishing's also more profitable, because, as well because of the weak pound, and it means that exports of fish are bringing home more pounds. It's an old wind, as they say. It feels like a long time since the fishing industry was in such buoyant mood. We should not forget that painful decisions were taken in the past, and there was real hardship in the industry at that time. However, it looks like this has paid off. The lesson we must learn from that is that we take fish stocks at, for granted at our peril. We must farm the seas and tend them to ensure that we never face cliff edges of the past again. Whether inside or outside the EU, these discussions and control of stocks have to be taken alongside our neighbours as fish respect no borders. It is only if we work together that we will ensure healthy stocks in the future. 
These talks could well be our last as full members of the Common Fisheries Policy for the full term of the negotiating period. The next, negotiating, next negotiations will be for the year that we're due to leave the European Union. Hopefully the parameters for post-Brexit post discussions about fisheries management will be in place by then so th those talks can be meaningful. With our fishing industry so buoyant, it would be a good time to take stock and plan strategically for the future. Where will our European exports enter into Europe? How, can, how will we ensure the least possible delays for fresh seafood if we're not in a customs union? Are there new markets we should be exploring and targeting? The European Union is currently the world's largest single fisheries market. In 2015, the UK exported over £900 million of fish and fish products to the European Union. That's almost 70% of the total UK exports for the sector. If Scotland is to continue to trade effectively with this market, it's vital that in future our seafood industry meets, meets EU standards, at least if not improve on those. We have led the way in the past and, that should and we should be able to continue to do so in the future. For the protection of our island's fishing industries, we need to make ensure that freight costs are island-proofed and that there is sufficient tr fre freight transport available. It wouldn't matter how big the catch we have if we can't get it to market. And Tavish Scott mentioned in his speech that this is a looming problem in Shetland regarding capacity. It's one that must be addressed now so that we are ready for the future. For these negotiations, the main issue that needs to be dealt with is the landing obligation and choke species. While the landing obligation is going well currently, it will become more difficult when it extends to species in a mixed fishery. To ensure that boats don't flout it, the regime has to be workable. It should not lead to boats being tied up for prolonged periods of time because they cannot fish due to a lack of quota for choke species. There surely must be a way of ensuring all fish caught are landed while also making it unattractive to target choke species which are at or beyond their allowed quota. Let us be clear, what happened before the landing obligation was in place when fish were caught, when that boat did not have quota, went back over the side dead, can't happen again. This did nothing to conserve fish, they were already dead. Such waste is immoral when so many people go without enough food Neither does it conserve stocks because fish are already dead when they return to the sea. At best, discards provide an easy meal for seabirds and other predators, but they do nothing for over quota species or indeed the environment. But if illicit fishing does occur, the result will be unaccounted for mortality, which will undermine the confidence in, in stock assessments and, turn, and, and in turn the quotas themselves. And this will result in overfishing and a decline in stock with a knock-on negative impact on the fishery. We need a workable landing obligation policy. Not that one that would stop fishermen working, but would... And, and would therefore cause hardship both, not just to those at sea, but processors on land. We need a policy that would allow bycatch to be landed and used, which would neither punish nor reward the boats that had inadvertently caught the fish. Landing it should not prove profitable. There is, of course, a risk that it would be profitable, especially if that species was in short supply and there was a high customer demand. There must be a way of allowing the boat enough profit to land it, but not enough profit to make it attractive to target. That way it is not wasted. We must also invest in, this, in science and technology to find ways of fishing more selectively in a mixed fishery. It allows effort, therefore, to be much more targeted. Technology is advancing to enable gear to fish in a more selective way, but it needs much more investment to help avoid choke species altogether, which is obviously the best option for us all. These debates happen every year, but they are important as ever this year despite Brexit. Our coastal communities are vulnerable and need a stable industry for their survival. 
It's not just the crews and the boats that depend on the industry. It's the processors and the workers on shore that do too. We obviously want the very best deal for our fishing industry. We all want a deal that ensures that stocks are protected for the future generations and current generations can make a living and we can all have fish to eat. We now move to the open debate and it's speeches of six minutes, please. Uh, Stuart Stevenson, followed by Liam Kerr. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, not every MSP attends uh, the fishing debate. Um, my first speech in Parliament in uh, June 2001 was on the subject of fishing, uh, just as my 716th today uh, is on the uh, subject of fishing. Uh, fishing, however, and its products touches us all. Only yesterday, uh, the lead item on the menu in the Scottish Parliament canteen was Peterhead smoked haddock fish cake. An absolutely delicious, I see the presiding officers nodding, absolutely delicious it was. So this is not an abstract issue. It's one which touches our palate, our stomach, our very, uh, our very being. It uh, sustains and supports our population and our health. And speaking of health, the fishing industry is in pretty good heart. Uh, it's looking forward to the sea of opportunity uh, that the catchphrase the Scottish Fishermen's Federation uh, have come up with uh, for the opportunities to come from leaving the CFP. Now, for my part, I've always been opposed to the common fisheries policy. Um, my political colleague, Donald Stewart MP, his speeches in uh, the Westminster Parliament right from the outset of the UK going into the EEC uh, until he uh, demitted office uh, are testament to his long-standing opposition as the member for the Western Isles uh, to the CFP. And Alan McCartney, that uh, wonderful member of the European Parliament, wrote an excellent paper on what should be a successor plan to the CFP some 20 years ago before his uh, uh, early death in office. It's worth getting out and having another read because we are now thinking in terms of uh, what next. Uh, this year's negotiation, of course, is the very last year of complete, uh, uh, the complete year before uh, Brexit. We've got to keep our eye on the prize, uh, which fishermen expect to come in 2020. Now, I can understand in tactical terms, Mr. Gove, going and speaking to the Danes and indeed to the Dutch, as he has done. But I think together with uh, some of the comments from Peter Chapman today, we're seeing the Tories giving away for no obvious benefit that we are hearing about uh, the, the, the prize that is there from the sea of opportunity. And Mr. Chapman, in his response to my intervention on the subject, Please sit down, provided no meaningful answer uh, to that subject. We have to get 100% control over our waters out to 200 miles. I do welcome the, the, the perhaps more than a hint that the London Convention will be abandoned because that helps us between six and 12 miles, although I'm not absolutely sure that particular one is nailed down. Because unless and until we get that control, we really don't have uh, the opportunity to map a way forward. And in that context, of course, we're looking at what Westminster are doing uh, on the EU, leaving the EU bill or the Great Reform Bill or whatever you choose to call it. Uh, the SFF are absolutely clear that the powers in relation to fishing must come straight uh, to Hollywood because they fear quite reasonably that they may not get the kind of uh, solutions to their needs if we rely simply on London. Now, there is a reason for that, and it's not a reason I criticise. Uh, English fishing interests uh, are mostly interested in controlling how much we catch by restriction of effort rather than by quota, whereas the Scottish fishing industry has a different approach that it wishes to see, and that is a quota-based approach uh, rather than one restriction of effort. We went through a period in the CFP where we'd both, and it was absolutely horrendous. So we would have clarity if we uh, make the decisions uh, in Scotland. We set the strategic objectives and take control of our waters. And that is a very simple uh, in a, a understanding of where the uh, Scottish Fishermen's Federations want to be. Now, 
How optimistic are the fishing industry? Well, there's new boats being built all over the place. Um, the new fish market in Peterhead that uh, will open uh, next year uh, that Peter Chapman referred to. Uh, I met with the Harbour Authority on Friday and had uh, an update on that. And of course, this very week, uh, we had the EMFF and Scottish Government providing funding uh, for a factory to take over a facility in Fraserburgh previously occupied by Young's Seafood. There truly is a sea of opportunity uh, out there. Now, science is important to how we take decisions in fishing, and there's no, there's no division among any of us on that. ISIS is the key place from which scientific uh, uh, opinion and understanding comes. It's, of course, unaffected by Brexit because ISIS has been around for more than 100 years telling us how long the fishing industry, who are really the arch conservationists at heart, if not necessarily every individual, uh, uh, and we will continue to participate in ISIS. However, will the Scottish contribution to the scientific work uh, be damaged by Brexit in the sense that we have quite a lot of uh, people working on our science who may not uh, readily have uh, the right of uh, 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 residency here uh, for the long term. Now, Peter Chapman, let me just conclude, uh, said he speaks on behalf of the industry. Well, I think the industry speaks on behalf of the industry. We are all here to support the industry. I don't know if Peter's been elected as a representative of any particular part of the industry, uh, but the important thing is that we're all united, and I think we will be at decision time, around a shared position that promotes the interests of our industry, ensures that we can exploit the sea of opportunity, and sees success in fishing communities across Scotland. Presiding officer. Thank you. Can I just remind members to use full names when referring to other members in the chamber? I call Liam Kerr to be followed by Emma Harper. Mr Kerr, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. So here we are again, the annual series of bi, tri and multilateral summits that determine next year's fishing quotas for EU, Norwegian, Faroese and Icelandic fishing fleets. And we await the lobbyists, the politicians, the commissioners, the council officials, European Parliament staffers and journalists at the annual two-day all-night bun fight at the Berleamont, emerging exhausted, waving the various deals and agreements they have wrestled over. It is, of course, in the main, a front. The summit is, for the British fleet at least, a rubber stamping exercise, with the major deals having been agreed, with little fanfare. Such as for our North Sea fleets, where big decisions were taken last week at the EU-Norway summit, with deals struck over cod, haddock, whiting and herring. The December Council is fundamentally the division of the EU's portion which was decided at the coastal states arrangements. And it's that which is concerning because of course currently fishing quotas are allocated to the UK as part of the EU's common fishery policy with individual UK countries having devolved responsibility over their share of the UK quotas. But this is the final time. This time next year we will be about four months away from being a coastal state at the table negotiating for ourselves. And this is good news, because currently each year, non-UK European, European Union fishing boats land on average 700,000 tonnes of fish and shellfish, worth almost 530 million from the UK exclusive economic zone. Non-UK EU fishing boats therefore landed almost eight times more fish and shellfish by weight from the UK EZ than UK boats did from other areas of the EU EZ. So Brexit is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity as it involves a system, systemic change in the restoration of the UK's exclusive economic zone. And this gives the country the potential to become a world leader in seafood production and exports. Now that is not to say isolation, of course. The UK will still need to cooperate with the EU after Brexit on quota setting. Cooperation on shared stocks is required as many fish stocks, as was pointed out earlier, are migratory and cross these boundaries. Such cooperation is currently seen in Norway and other non-EU European countries. Such cooperation is enshrined in international law. The UN Agreement on Straddling Fish Stocks and Highly Migratory Fish Stocks and the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea require cooperation on the conservation and management of fish stocks. The UK has ratified these agreements. And this uh, leads me to the motion's call for the best outcome for our fishermen because they, give, they work to give themselves that best outcome. Our fishing industry is innovative and hard working and has been at the forefront of pioneering new nets 
to reduce discarding practices, the voluntary use of CCTV monitoring on boats, and an onboard observer scheme. I've been struck a number of times when actually on board fishing vessels in Peterhead and Stonehaven by how fishermen are among the country's best examples of entrepreneurs. Super trawlers of more than 70 metres with yards of flat digital monitors and ensuite rooms costing some £20 million. Family businesses with shareholder crews. Mackerel fishermen who foresaw that pelagic fish would be worth something, invested, and now, as the Cabinet Secretary pointed out earlier, is the biggest value species not only in the UK, but in the whole of the EU. Locally driven investment which benefits the industry, the locality, and the local supply chain. Which is why I commend the motion and the Scottish Conservative Amendment in calling for support for our innovative, pioneering and hard-working fishing industry. And it's in... Briefly, please. Lewis MacDonald. I'm very grateful. Uh, Mr Chapman didn't lay out the reasons for the specific detail of the Conservative Amendment in his opening speech, and I wonder if you might enlighten us. Liam Kerr. Uh, I thank Mr Macdonald for that. Uh, yes, it's, it, just very briefly to narrow down the specific political issues that, uh, that could be raised by others within the motion if it weren't made clear that, that shouldn't be a consideration. Uh, it's an industry, uh, forgive me, someone wasn't listening. Uh, you, you can read it back on the official record, Stuart Stevenson. It's an industry that includes fish processing. Here I want to pick up a point made by Peter Chapman when he talked of fish processing, which draws in the motion's mention of the wider sector. Scottish processors conduct primary and secondary processing, with many factories carrying out a mix of both types. But Peter Chapman rightly highlighted serious challenges. There has been a 34% decline in processing sites since 2008, more marked in Scotland than in England. And seafood-related employment fell in the northeast of Scotland by 4%, uh, whilst in Humberside there was an increase of 7%. Why has that declined? Well, a number of reasons have been suggested, such as high operating costs and challenges to attract investment, a low margin industry competing in a global market, business rates, which have disproportionately impacted the Northeast. Uh, at the CPG on fisheries, industry expert Jimmy Buchan put together some suggestions, principally around those business rates relief and innovative changes, many of which merit further consideration. And so we're pleased to back this motion, calling for the best possible deal from the fishing negotiations. We very much support the Scottish Government in its efforts to achieve the best possible outcome for the fishermen, coastal communities and wider seafood sectors. And we recognise that the motion seeks to recognise the real opportunity of sustained economic benefit for our coastal communities and seafood sectors. But such benefits can only happen if parliamentarians from all parts of the political spectrum join together and throw their support behind our fishing communities to ensure the best possible deal for fishing. And as we give that support, let us in this chamber never forget that tonight, as on every night, there are those out on the boats willing to risk all weathers, to risk life and limb, to put food on our tables, something for which I hope all in this chamber are eternally grateful. Thank you. Uh, I say to members, there is time in hand for interventions, uh, preferably not from a sedentary position. Uh, I call Emma Harper to be followed by Claudia Beamish, please. Thank you, President Officer. Before continuing, I would like to remind Chamber that uh, I am the Parliamentary Liaison Officer for the Cabinet Secretary. Um, I welcome the Scottish Government's motion and commend the Cabinet Secretary's constructive involvement in recent negotiations. Scotland secured a number of its objectives as negotiations between the EU and Norway concluded. There will be a quota increases for five of the six North Sea stocks that are jointly managed with Norway, increasing catching opportunities for Scotland's fishing industry and delivering more in economic terms for Scotland. I know that the Scottish Government will fight hard to ensure that the negotiated settlement promotes sustainable fisheries and has the best interests of Scotland's fishermen, coastal communities and wider seafood sectors at its heart. Vitally, we will be guided by the science and respect stock sustainability while maximising fishing opportunities. The EU plays a key role for the Scottish fishermen by setting the annual total allowable catches for all quota regulated species and for all European Union fishing fleets. This is always a complex negotiation and given Scotland's majority interest in UK fishing, the Scottish Government plays a prominent role in promoting our fishing priorities in Brussels annually. 
While the Common Fisheries Policy has been cumbersome on the fishing industry, membership of the European Union has brought benefits and the prospect of Scotland being taken out of the EU is very real and has implications for the industry, which I would like to discuss today. The EU is the largest overseas market for Scotland's seafood exports and the UK Government's pursuit of a hard Brexit would likely create huge barriers to trade with vital European markets. In the south of Scotland, fishing is a key industry. The region's harbours and many directly related onshore jobs depend on the industry, as well as other local livelihoods not directly connected, such as the food and drink sector. Inshore fisheries in thriving towns like Kirkubri could be financially impacted by non-tariff barriers after Brexit. For example, if trade barriers delay the process of exporting food such as shellfish past a certain time of day, the price can drop as much as 50%. In the absence of a trade deal with the EU, a switch to the default World Trade Organisation tariff arrangements could lead to EU tariffs averaging between 7 and 13% being imposed on Scottish seafood exports to the UK. Of course, I'll take an intervention. Liam Kerr. I thank the member for taking the intervention. Just very briefly, does she recognise that 10 of the top 20 export countries for UK fish are currently out with the European Union? Emma Harper. Yes, but the EU is the biggest market. I should say thank you for that intervention. Um, but the EU is still the biggest market that we have. So although there are countries out with the EU, we shouldn't negate other opportunities as we proceed. James Withers, the Chief Executive of Scotland's Food and Drink, has described such a no-deal scenario as a disaster. In the absence of full EU membership, Scotland's interests would best be protected by remaining in the single market and customs union. Leaked draft plans for the Irish border last week showed that British and Irish officials agreed proposals that would effectively keep Northern Ireland in both the single market and the customs union after Brexit by retaining EU regulations. If one part of the UK can retain regulatory alignment with the EU and effectively stay in the single market, there is surely no good practical reason why others can't. It is of vital importance to ensure that the Scottish Parliament has the powers to fully manage Scottish fisheries after Brexit. This will ensure that fisheries management in Scottish waters reflects the interest of the Scottish industry and fishing communities and is sensitive to the Scottish marine environment. This is a position which is supported by the Scottish Fishing Federation, who have expressed deep concern about Clause 11 in the EU Withdrawal Bill, which will allow Westminster to retain powers currently held by the EU. This includes the operable elements of the Common Fisheries Policy, which the UK Government has indicated it intends to roll forward and which will become subject to the decisions of the UK Government after exit day, not the Scottish Government. In their submission to the Finance Committee earlier this year, the SS SFF stated that this approach will dramatically limit Scotland's ability to deliver effective reactive fisheries management. This is not an outcome that the industry wants to see, and I look forward to Theresa May beginning to engage fully with our First Minister in an attempt to give us some much needed certainty over the legislative landscape for the industry as we look post-Brexit. I know that the Scottish Government will continue to do all it can to protect Scotland's interest and ensure that devolved functions continue to function fully and effectively. Presiding officer, Scotland is strategically placed to have the best fishing industry in Europe and the SNP is committed to doing it all, all it can to make that a reality. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Ms Beamish, please. Thank you, presiding officer. 2018 will indeed be a complex year for our fisheries. Whatever the outcome of the Brexit negotiations, our ambition to supply high quality seafood with high quality environmental standards must never waver. The Cabinet Secretary is right to look in the Scottish Government motion at the best possible outcome for Scotland's fishermen, coastal communities and wider seafood sectors. He also recognises that a healthy environment uh, in our marine world is vital for the prosperity of them all. Though it has uh, been, had many critics, the Common Fisheries Policy has anchored sustainability into EU-wide fisheries management, 
Whatever the future holds, any new trading relationships should enhance that. There will also, this, this coming year, be a UK fisheries bill, and we hope that there will be proper liaison with the uh, Westminster colleagues about, about, this, about the issues that affect Scotland and indeed the whole of the UK. And there will, of course, be scrutiny as this develops. I would like to thank all those who provided briefings for today uh, from a range of perspectives for this debate, including, of course, SFF and the newly formed charity Open Seas. Scottish Labour is clear that responsibility for the, our fisheries should revert to Scotland after leaving the EU. There are, indeed, colossal challenges. We need to support the wide-ranging industry while underpinning this support with a continuing robust commitment to protection and, I stress, enhancement of our marine environment, on which some good progress has already been made. Together, we must forge a sustainable way forward for our fisheries sectors, a marine environment that gives us such plenty for now and for the future, as Rhoda Grant has highlighted. Of course, we will still be subject to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which demands quotas and sustainable management. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's words on scientific advice in this debate's motion. The sharing of knowledge and research is one of the greatest tenets of the EU, and it is a great shame that our involvement in the EU-wide data exchange remains uncertain at this stage, although I do know what Stuart Stevenson has said about ISIS being very important. The, Mar the European Marine Fisheries Fund, I want to highlight as well, it's made a significant contribution to our coastal communities and maritime sector, as well as Marine Scotland's expenditure on science, data and compliance. And it's concerning to learn there will no longer be uh, a, a, an assurance that this can be protected after Brexit, of course. Can the Cabinet, Sec Cabinet Secretary acknowledge in his closing remarks the significance of the support this fund has provided and inform the Chamber of any discussions about the need for future funding of this nature and how this may, well, how this may happen? Climate change, uh, in my brief, is a major threat to our marine ecosystems and scientific advice will become increasingly vital to support a sustainable fisheries industry in warming seas. The Scottish Association of Marine Science have predicted that global warming can cause cod, herring and haddock, all commercially important species here in Scotland, to vanish from our west coast by the turn of the century, unless more is done. Effects of this kind can be felt very heavily as cod and haddock are now being caught far, far further north near Iceland and sold back to the UK to satisfy consumer demands. And I would welcome comment from the Cabinet Secretary on how these changing ecosystems and shifting species are being accounted for and discussed in quota negotiations as these lie alongside the pressing issues of choked species and other matters in this year's negotiations. And I hope the Cabinet Secretary has noted my colleague Rhoda Grant's points on, on the choked species. I commend the fishing fleets for their adaptation to the landing obligation and the steps taken for self-regulation thus far. Marine Scotland is working to make compliance as easy as possible for fishermen and are experimenting with technologies. But this support is reliable on Marine Scotland's resources, and this indeed, we must be sure, is supported. Plastic pollution in our marine environment has become one of the most compelling environmental issues of our day, not just thanks to Sir David Attenborough's Blue Planet, but also to the uh, Marine Conservation Society and the work of um, many environmental groups. But what people may not know is the impressive work of Fishing for Litter, the project which engages the fishing industry, local communities and schools. And since 2005, this project has landed over 1,102 tonnes of plastic litter in 18 ports, including in my region of South Scotland. While humans absorb fewer than 1% of plastic fragments, the effect is cumulative. And around the world, of course, people have an interest in our exports and our famous fish and shell, shell fish project, uh, produce, and many are working to sustain this reputation, and I would be interested to know if this is an issue the Scottish Government will be raising in this year's negotiations. Finally, to focus again on Brexit, our significant seafood processing sector must continue to be supported. In Dumfries and Galloway, the fishing and seafood sector plays a significant role in the local economy, as it does across Scotland. 
from fishing out of Kukubri to processing in Annan. It contributes more than 20 million pounds and provides employment for some thousand people. Indeed, in just one town in Annan, over 120 people are employed at Young's and, seven, and for 70 years it has been the biggest um, scampi selling place in, in Scotland. And just around the corner, Pinnies of Scotland, now owned by Young's, employs 200 people in fish processing. Much of this work can be seasonal, and I do highlight this to the Cabinet Secretary today, which I know he's keenly aware of. Some of them are not seasonal, though, but are people who have uh, brought their families here and are part of our Scottish world, and it's very important that we protect both these um, ways of working. So I, I do wish the Cabinet Secretary well again in, in this year's negotiations on, on behalf of Scottish Labour, and I'm sure from across the Chamber and, and from the fishing industry itself, and we look forward to hearing um, positive results. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mark Ruskell to be followed by Angus MacDonald. Mr Ruskell, Thank please. you, uh, Presiding Officer, and uh, as is the Holyrood tradition, um, can I also uh, wish good luck to the Cabinet Secretary in the forthcoming uh, December talks. Um, it's always a culmination of a long and very involved stakeholder process across Europe, and having spent a brief spell as a member of the Northwest Waters Regional Advisory Council, I do recognise the toil involved in poring over stock assessments in windowless Brussels meeting rooms for many, many months. Um, now, of course, we don't know what the arrangements will be around bilateral and multilateral agreements going forward post-2019. We also don't know what the common UK frameworks will emerge from the UK Fisheries Bill. But whatever machinery of negotiation we end up with, the hard-won principles around sustainability must endure post-Brexit. And it's absolutely clear that nature demands that we don't fish beyond the capacity of a species to reproduce itself which is why the principle of maximum sustainable yield needs to be embedded. And alongside that, the key European principle of a precautionary approach must be retained. To hold back from levels of fishing effort that could tip stocks into serious decline is essential. Stock recovery plans will always cause pain to fishers. Preventing collapse through precautionary action is the best course up front. So in relation to this year's negotiations, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary whether he will be pushing for the science to be followed on all stocks to meet our MSY 2020 obligations? And if he does not support the advice on some stocks, then in the interest of transparency, he needs to set out in more detail than he has today the reasons for not doing so. Now, we have turned the corner with overfishing in the EU, and a number of members have reflected on that. Just a few years ago, nearly three quarters of stocks were being dangerously fished out whereas less than half are today. But, you know, there's still a long way to go. And a commitment is needed to ensure that scientific vice and limits are actually reflected in fishing practice on the water. Discarded fish may not contribute to business balance sheets, but they have a big impact on ecology. So a discarding ban needs to be enforced. Illicit discarding also undermines the very stock assessments that fishers, conservationists, and governments need confidence in to make the right decisions leading to a downward spiral of overfishing and further declines in stock health. I think a point that Rhoda Grant has already reflected on. And eliminating discards on the six key whitefish species clearly would add economic benefit, with estimates showing additional value of landings in Scotland could bring in an extra £28 million a year by 2020. Developing the selective gear and techniques to avoid non-target species is worth investing in, and Scotland has a good track record in leading these conservation approaches over many years. But we should now also be leading the way in monitoring. And at present, less than 1% of fishing activities are monitored at sea. Now, this is going to change, obviously, and Scotland has the opportunity to lead that race to the top in verifying the quality and sustainability of our produce through remote electronic monitoring cameras on our boats. And I note the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary's uh, response to my question. Uh, I would like to know in, in closing whether the Cabinet Secretary would support remote electronic monitoring on all boats over 10 metres long. Because that data that we can gather through electronic monitoring will not only ensure that we make the best use of limited budgets for compliance, it will also help to deliver some of the science needed for more accurate stock assessments that benefits everyone, including the industry. Now, the science also tells us where key habitats and species thrive and how we can save and enhance them through marine protected areas. 
By enhancing spawning grounds, we protect the parts that lead to greater productivity and resilience overall, which is essential in an age of real and growing threats from climate change. So some boldness is needed from the Scottish Government in completing the MPA network set out by SNH three years ago. Now, I'd like to just briefly turn to the post-Brexit picture, and we've heard many contributions already in this debate. The fishing lobby in Scotland and the UK want to take back control of the exclusive economic areas of the UK seas and unpick fishing rights held by other countries, some of which, of course, predate our entry to the European Union. But the question is, at what cost, and will that actually result in any more fish being landed? The UN laws of the sea require states to allow access to surplus fishing quota based on historic use, and it's unlikely the EU would want to strike a deal with the UK without preserving some access to those historic catches. But, okay, if the, if the UK ignored this, then what about the impact on trade? We're in a position, and we've heard from many members already, where the vast majority of what's caught in our waters is sold to Europe while the tastes of our own domestic markets rely heavily on the nets of Greenland, Iceland, and Norway. So unraveling and separating access to markets and fishing areas would be highly problematic. And if the UK just decided to walk away from deals, then that could be absolutely disastrous, leading parties to ignore the science completely and go back to the unsustainable levels of catch that we saw during the mackerel wars, alongside all the sanctions and port prohibitions that that brought. So this, presiding officer, is why we need a debate on both fisheries and agriculture about what the public interest actually is and what public goods these sectors deliver. What replaces the European Marine Fisheries Fund in a post-Brexit UK's fishery policy remains to be seen. But to deliver public goods, it must be focused on science and technological innovation to deliver healthy stocks and an industry that serves the needs of communities rather than a small handful of quota barons. Thank you. Thank you. I call Angus MacDonald to be followed by Edward Mountain. Mr MacDonald, please. Thank you, uh, President Officer. It's been some time since I took part in a fisheries debate in this place, um, which is probably at the end of session four, so I'm pleased to be contributing today, uh, even though there's a feeling of, of deja vu, uh, and members still start, or some members still start their speeches with, here we are again. Um, so, b being a fan of uh, all things Nordic, um, I was certainly pleased to see the uh, relative success of the EU-Norway deal uh, following negotiations last week, bring some additional success with Scotland securing a number of its negotia negotiation objectives when fisheries talks between the EU and Norway concluded in Bergen. Uh, and, uh, of course, as the Cabinet Secretary mentioned, the coastal state negotiations continue with the Faroe Islands as we speak. As a result of the negotiations in Bergen, there's been a welcome quota increase for five of the six North Sea stocks that are jointly managed with Norway, including 38% for whiting, 25% for herring, 24% for haddock, and 10% for cod, and that cod, haddock, saith, and herring will be fished at sustainable or MSY levels in 2018, with whiting on a clearly defined path towards MSY by 2020. There was, however, disappointment that the EU's negotiators have continued to trade away safe quota in both the North Sea and the West of Scotland. Uh, and this is uh, a significant choke risk stock for Scotland in the North Sea. And I have to say, it seems crazy to give away to Norway stocks that we remain short of ourselves in Scotland. It makes no economic or fishing sense and puts the industry in an extremely difficult position under the landing obligation. And with regard to the landing obligation, President Officer, um, clearly and historically, Scotland has been very supportive of the landing obligation and stopping the practice of throwing dead fish back into sea. Uh, we certainly wouldn't want uh, to return to unaccounted levels of discarding, which will ultimately harm the stocks, resulting in reduced scientific advice, all flowing back to reduced economic returns for the fleet. Under our own catching policy, if we're allowed to develop one, uh, we would deal primarily with fish availability and practical solutions, ideally allowing juvenile fish to be returned to the sea as of no value, but as long as they were accounted for, perhaps by cameras or cameras on vessels, and I'll hope to develop that point later in my speech. Uh, but overall, I think it's fair to say the negotiations in Norway went well and followed the good news a couple of months ago that the quantity and value of fish landed in Scotland had once more increased with the value of fish landed by Scottish registered vessels in 2016 increasing by 25% in real terms, according to the latest statistics published by the Scottish Government. 
driven by an increase in the value of pelagic species, 453,000 uh, 453, tonnes of seafish and shellfish was landed by Scottish registered vessels with a value of £557 million, as the Cabinet Secretary uh, alluded to in his opening speech. And mackerel continues to be the most valuable stock, accounting for £169 million in Scottish landings. Uh, compared to the previous year, the volume of landings increased by 3%. So it's far from doom and gloom for Scotland's fishermen these days, although we still don't know if, after we leave the EU, whether powers over fisheries will be returned to this Parliament and not retained by the UK Government. And with the fish processors also faced with the uncertainty of Brexit, it's been good to see the Scottish Government supporting them through the EMFF. Um, now, we know that the UK has been allocated €243.1 million Euros in fisheries funding from uh, 2014 to 2020 under the EMFF, which the Scottish Government fights hard uh, for to ensure we get Scotland's fair share of that funding, which is currently 46% of the UK's share, with £81 million pounds allocated from the EU to help Scottish businesses expand and become more sustainable over the current 2014 to 2020 funding period. And of course, the Scottish Government provides a further 53 million to EMF awarded projects. And of course, we're also a major recipient of EU scientific funding. Now, while the EMFF funding will remain available while the UK is a member of the EU, once the UK leaves, uh, although some of us harbour a slight hope that we don't leave, uh, our fisheries will still need financial support to make the transition to a sustainable fleet that is moving towards discard-free fisheries. Uh, this will require to include funding for improving selective activities, both behaviour and gear, uh, monitoring and enforcement, and strong science to underpin management decisions. But will that funding be available? Well, we'll simply have to wait and see, but there's no doubt in my mind that effective monitoring, control and enforcement is key for sustainable fisheries management and particularly for monitoring the effectiveness of the landing obligation. Uh, at present, it's estimated that less than 1% of fishing activities are monitored at sea, as Mark Russell, Ruskell has already mentioned. And better use needs to be made of existing resources to monitor fisheries compliance at sea effectively. The use of cost-effective remote electronic camera technology to support best practice should, in my view, be implemented with the added benefit of collecting catch data that could be used to feed into assessments and support quota management. Clearly, Scotland has huge potential to market high-quality, sustainable seafood, and it must continue to work hard on providing confidence that this is the case. And I think it's worth noting, President Officer, that New Zealand has just introduced remote electronic monitoring with cameras across its entire fleet, citing the reasons for doing so as reduction of waste and more responsive decision-making and increased public confidence. And I was pleased to hear the Cabinet Secretary acknowledge the benefits of remote electronic monitoring following Mark Ruskell's earlier intervention. Now, without monitoring technology, the only ways of certi certifying catches are to rely on vessels' own reporting, patchy satellite observations and occasional onshore monitoring of catches, nets and practices. And if this move uh, to onboard cameras is to be resisted by the industry, then it's worth highlighting that since 2015, costs per vessel over 10 metres in length for modern technology have come down by over a fifth to less than £4,000 a year. So it's clear, presiding officer, that remote electronic monitoring is a gateway to sustainable fishing, providing correct data for science and also reassured consumers. In closing, presiding officer, I have to take issue with the Tory amendment, which would seem to encourage setting aside existing rules to favour unsustainable fishing, which simply cannot and should not be supported. Finally, I wish the Cabinet Secretary, Marine Scotland and other officials good luck at the imminent December Council and I look forward to confirmation of a good result uh, for Scotland's fishermen as was secured last year. Thank you. Thank you. I call Edward Mountain to be followed by Ivan McKee. Mr Mountain, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's fair to say that last time this Chamber debated the future of Scottish fisheries, it seemed to be a clash over the merits or the dismerits of Brexit. I'm glad to say that the Cabinet Secretary today has tried to avoid a repeat of that and his motion does not mention it. I'm saddened that some have not tried to do that and, and have tried to drag this down to a level of Brexit or not Brexit. Lever or Remainer, it doesn't matter to me. The public's message is clear whether you're standing on the quayside or in the field. Stop bringing us continual problems, bring us solutions. And that's what I think we should be doing. We should all be, and I'm sure we are all, pro-Scottish fisheries. And we need to support our fishermen by laying the groundwork for the industry 
post-Brexit. Scottish fishermen want a speedy exit from the common fisheries policy, but they recognise they will need a nine-month bridge to smooth that exit. I support that. Their sights are firmly set on the future and what's what, what works best for the industry. However, they are rightly concerned that the Scottish Government is not always being as proactive as it could be, taking advantage of the obvious opportunities which Brexit may present. And why? It's simple, really. Too many mixed messages. Yes, I'll certainly take an intervention. Can I just get to the end of this section? Too many mixed messages. The SNP say they oppose the common fisheries policy, but still squirm at the thought of signing the Scottish Fishermen's Federation's pledge to leave the failed common fisheries policy. Well, not all of them, really. Stuart Stevenson, who's sadly not here, may have been proved to be the biggest catch of the day when he joined the Scottish Conservative MPs and M MSPs in signing this pledge. Uh, Rhoda Grant. Rhoda Grant. Sorry, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I thank the member for giving way. Can the member tell us exactly what their amendment means? Um, Angus MacDonald has given his explanation. I'm not entirely clear on the third Conservative speaker what their amendment means. Edward Mountain. Well, first of all, it is going to be made exactly clear in the summing up, but it is... <laughs> sorry, I mean, you, uh, sorry, presiding officer, I'm not used to taking interjections from people sitting down. If they want to make an interjection, I'm, I'll, I'll surely take well, it. Well, that's If really they stand up, or I may try and answer the question themselves. Mr. Mountain, that's really, that's really for me to say, not you. Sorry, presiding officer. <laughs> presiding officer, I will take an intervention. <laughs> Mike Rumbles. Thank you for giving way. It is a genuine question. We are very puzzled. I mean, you're the third Conservative speaker, and none of us in this side of the chamber have a clue what the Conservative amendment actually means. Could you enlighten us? Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And yes, I'm delighted to take an intervention from Mr Rumbles. The, 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 the amendment in, in the motion is to allow us to use negotiations to get past the problems of choked species. And Donald Cameron, when he sums up, will actually clarify what we mean by that. So, signing the pledge, which is where we got to, sorry, signing the pledge, which is where we got to, doesn't make you a Brexiteer. It just makes you want to do what is right for our fishermen by re-establishing the UK as an independent coastal state. And that's the prize that our fishermen, I believe, are after. Whilst we welcome the good news of this year's EU-Norway talks, which saw quota increases for five of the six North Sea stocks, it was a different story last year. In 2016, the same talks were a mixed bag for our fishermen, with no uplift in the UK quota for blue whiting and cuts to the side of the quota for herring and haddock. Those de decisions favoured Norwegian fishermen, despite Scottish fishermen working hard to restore the stocks to healthy levels, and those quotas highlighted the superior position of independent coastal states negotiating with the EU. As our fishermen know only too well, the EU has an uncanny habit of negotiating a bad deal for our industry. This year's talks were far more positive, but Scottish fishermen still lost out on the EU negotiation was the... Sorry, we'll will still lost out as the EU negotiates for what is best for the other 27 members. Scottish Conservatives were disappointed with this as much as the Cabinet Secretary was, and to quote his words back to him, if I indeed may, it is, and his words were, we remain fully opposed in principle to giving Norway stocks that would remain short of ourselves. This makes no economic sense nor fishing sense and risks putting the industry in a difficult position under the landing obligation. Re-establishing the UK as an independent coastal state with a power of negotiation of our own quotas will give us the potential to stop bad deals brokered by the EU. With the EU finally sitting at the table, it can strike bilateral deals with Norway in the North Sea and strike a tripartite deal with the EU and Norway in the Southern North Sea. These deals will better serve the interests of Scottish fishermen. In Scotland, as we all know, we, have, we are fortunate to have some of the best fishing grounds in the world and a fishing industry that is growing in confidence. During the summer, I visited Kinloch Burvey and saw the fish market there and heard about two new boats where they were almost ready to go into service. They were being investing in Scotland and that's what we would all like to see. But it's not the only good news in the region that I represent. Glenmorangie Distillery have partnered with Heriot Watt University 
and the Marine Conservation Society to restore the population of oysters in the Dawn at Firth for the first time in 100 years. But they're not stopping there. The distillery is now aiming towards establishing a new reef within five years. Two success stories from the Highlands and two examples that show a confident industry investing in its future. Now it's time for the Scottish Government to take the proactive approach which matches the confidence our, the fishermen, our fishermen have. Presiding officer, I urge the Scottish Government to listen to the fishing industry and make every available effort to assist the UK Government in seeking a smooth exit from the common fisheries policy. As the EQ, e, UK moves closer to becoming an in, independent coastal state, the preparation for work for what is required afterward must now begin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I call Ivan McKee, the last speaker in the open debate, which means obviously we then move to closing speeches. Warning to all. Mr McKee, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The fishing industry is of vital importance to Scotland and its success is critical for many of our communities around the country. It is a central component of our successful food and drink sector and a key part of our national economic growth strategy, built as it is upon the four pillars of innovation, inclusive growth, investment and internationalisation because Scotland's rapidly growing food and drink exports valued at more than £5 billion are a vital sector for our future prosperity, focused as they are on premium products much in demand across the world. Fishing is an industry we should protect and encourage to grow. All parts of the sector are of importance. The catching sector, the larger processing sector and the onward marketing and sale of our fish around the world. The catching sector, which employs almost 5,000 people in Scotland, has seen recent growth. Over the course of a year, the value of fish landed by Scottish registered vessels in 2016 increased by 25% in real terms, with a value of more than half a billion pounds. And the number of Scottish registered vessels also saw an increase. And while it is of vital importance that we ensure the catching sector is successful to protect coastal communities, uh, such a key part of, we must also strive to ensure that the processing sector is not threatened by access to the EU labour force it relies on. Up to 70% of fish processing workers in the North East, for example, are from the EU, and their ability to stay and support this vital sector is under threat as a consequence of the hard Brexit decisions taken by this Tory government. Overshadowing the current ongoing fishery negotiations... Yep. Liam Kerr. You may acknowledge that the fish processing sector, as I said in my speech, has, uh, has suffered a, a decline in numbers since 2008, which was long before Brexit came along. Is that not true? I've Mickey. Biggest threat, as the member well knows, uh, to the processing industry, as to so many sectors of Scotland's economy, is the hard Brexit the Tory government that he supports is following and the restrictions it's going to place on our ability, sectors like fish processing, to access EU workers. And of course, overshadowing the current ongoing fishery negotiations are the shambles that are the Brexit negotiations. The UK government's ill-advised pursuit of a hard Brexit creates significant risk to this vital and growing business that Scotland's seafood exports. And certainly, uncertainty abounds around the Brexit negotiations and the risks of both tariff and non-tariff barriers to Scotland's food exports is real. As James Withers, Chief Executive of Scotland Food and Drink, has said, a no-deal Brexit would be a disaster. Without free unhindered routes to market, fish stocks will rot in trucks at customs, destroying the value of produce and a source of export revenue vital to the Scottish economy. The EU is the largest overseas market for Scotland's seafood exports. Scotland's food and drink exports in the first half of 2017 grew by 119 million over the same period the previous year. A move to world trade organisation arrangements would lead to tariffs of between 7 and 13 per cent being imposed in Scottish seafood exports to the EU. In addition, non-tariff barriers, including additional certification, comply with EU rules of origin requirements at a real risk, resulting in longer delays at customs ports. We all agree that fish stocks need to be managed and that this management should be science-based, relying as it does on the work of ISIS to inform the sustainability of our fish stocks. As the Cabinet Secretary has made clear, the Scottish Government is committed to ensuring sustainability of fisheries in line with the scientific evidence. The EU Common Fisheries Policy negotiations are now underway and will likely conclude at the December Council next week. We support the Cabinet Secretary in the work he will do as part of that process. It should be remembered, of course, that Scotland will not have a seat at the, will not have a seat at the negotiation table, but will have to work through UK Government Ministers, despite the fact that two-thirds of the total fish caught in the UK is landed north of the border. 
It should also be noted that, unlike, for example, the Norwegians, the UK does not include fishermen in its negotiating team. The outcome of the Brussels negotiation will be pivotal in helping ensure Scotland's fishing in, sorry, will be pivotal in helping Scotland's fishing fleet reduce the possible impacts of chalk species and the potential they have to tie up the fleet. The Scottish Government is concerned to ensure that all available solutions are explored and adopted to prevent that happening. The Scottish Fishermen's Federation have made many constructive points regarding how the UK Government should approach the December Council negotiations, and the SFF briefing issued was very helpful in this regard, setting out as it does how stances taken by the UK Government in this year's negotiations could impact on the success of future negotiations when the UK will act as a coastal state in its own right. There is, however, a lack of clarity from UK Government ministers around whether the UK will leave the Common Fisheries Policy in March 2019 when they intend for the UK to leave the EU or at the end of the transition period. Whatever, the key point that we must not lose sight of is that control of Scottish fisheries and Scottish waters needs to come to this Parliament rather than be controlled by Westminster. It is the Scottish Parliament that has the best interests of the Scottish fishing industry at heart. Westminster, on the other hand, has other priorities, as evidenced by the commitment given by Michael Gove to the Danes and the Dutch, as has been mentioned already in this debate, concerning their access to Scottish waters post-Brexit as part of wider UK trade negotiations. In conclusion, presiding officer, the Scottish fishing industry, including the catching, processing and exporting parts of the business, is not only an iconic part of Scotland's economy, it's not only vital to ensuring many of our coastal communities survive and thrive, it's also a critical part of Scotland's dynamic and expanding high-quality food and drink sector, and as such, it's a key role to play in the future success of Scotland's economy. Scotland is strategically placed to have the best fishing industry in Europe, and the Scottish Government is committed to doing all it can to make that a reality. With that in mind, I would like to take this opportunity to wish the Cabinet Secretary the best of success in representing Scotland's interests at the forthcoming negotiations in Brussels this coming week. Thank you. Closing speech as I call on Tavish Scott. Close the Liberal Democrats, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, so Mr, F Mr. Uh, Ewing will uh, be the third fisheries minister that has concluded this, uh, uh, this the 18th, I think, fisheries debate over the, uh, uh, over the time of this uh, parliament following Mr. Lockhead and, and Mr. Finney. And I had a quick uh, look back last night uh, at some of the more memorable debates uh, of that period uh, when the uh, Cabinet Secretary had to, be, had to have a phalanx of ministers uh, around him to protect him from the vagaries of, the, of whatever was being debated on that time. He's only got one today, so, uh, so it must, that must go down as a, a, a kind of quiet afternoon before, before he heads for uh, Brussels. But uh, a number of colleagues... <laughs> 30 seconds. 30 I, um, seconds. I will regret this, but of course... Well, you did say quiet. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to directly criticise the number he used, but I can say in the, my first five years here, um, I participated in 14 fishing debates, so I think the number is substantially higher than he's just quoted. Well, that, Scott. of course, will be right, but, but, um, uh, but, but I think I meant the annual debate on the annual negotiations leading up to Christmas, uh, uh, rather than possibly many others that we have, as Mr. Stevenson rightly says, had. Um, Mr. Ewing set out an entirely fair assessment of the uh, current position leading into these uh, talks this year, and without shadow of a doubt, as members from across the chamber have reflected, the situation is uh, considerably more positive than has been the case in, in some other years, and that's a reflection on, on uh, uh, the nature of our seas. And I, I take the point that Mark Ruskell and indeed Claudia Beamish have made about uh, the environmental criteria. I think one of the strongest points actually Stuart Stevenson made was about ISIS um, scientific evidence and, and the basis for that, the baseline for that, and the fact that we are, as, as both uh, in terms of Scotland, and I presume this is also the case for the UK, absolutely committed to that over uh, and for the future because the uh, essential uh, component of that is the long-term data. I take the Blue Planet planet point as well that Claudia Beamish was making, that not only is it fantastic television actually, but the Attenborough uh, narrative through that is about the strength and the importance of science over a period of time. And even in an industry such as this, which has had its critics of science, and there's been some dodgy days on, on uh, scientific assessments uh, on, from both sides of that argument, uh, I think the fundamental argument that Parliament's making this afternoon about the strength of science is uh, a, both a reasonable one and an important one for the future. Uh, Rhoda Grant and many other members, indeed the Cabinet Secretary, have made the argument about choke species, and they're right. Uh, my only contention on this one, and I'm sure uh, Fergus, you'll be the first to acknowledge it, is the minute we enter into a discard ban as a matter of principle, we create um, choke 
stalk species as a point of, of practical import of that proposal. And when um, policy is being devised for the future, when and if uh, Marine Scotland and, and government advisers get space to ever get to this point, um, the fundamental contradiction in some ways between um, a discard ban on one hand and the inevitability of choke species and how the quota system works in a mixed fishery is and has to be tackled. Uh, and and I, I hope at some stage uh, we get to that point. Frankly, a different policy approach, um, if we had that famous blank piece of paper, uh, would be important in taking uh, that forward. But nevertheless, the, the, the points that members have made from across the chamber on the reality of, of the choke species uh, is uh, absolutely the case. I was very grateful to Mr Ewing for his point about the 2014 so-called deal on EU Faro. Um, the many adjectives could be applied to that uh, so-called uh, deal, and I won't enter into the rhetoric. It's now some time past, but I am genuinely grateful to his point that the government are looking closely at, at uh, how that can be reassessed uh, in, in the right way for the future. And I hope he'll, he'll press that point with uh, all vigour. I suppose as I've been churlish, he, he, he said that he had achieved 24 out of his 26 goals last year. I mean, that's an absolute disgrace. Why did he not achieve the full uh, 26? What was wrong with those other uh, two? And I hope he'll come back this year with a much better deal that takes all those to it. But, I, but that would be unfair and it would be completely churlish for me to make that, uh, make that remark. But um, we might all have some fun later about uh, what the two were that, uh, that didn't uh, quite uh, make it. Um, Peter Chapman actually made two points that I entirely agreed with. Uh, the first was on uh, local infrastructure and the importance uh, of that uh, and the, uh, he, he made the point about the uh, Peterhead fish market. My recollection is that fish market uh, w uh, received a large grant from the European Union uh, for, its, uh, for its erection. Uh, there are, we have the same aspirations in Lerwick once we get uh, one or two sh uh, small issues sorted out uh, such as the tendering procedure uh, but uh, the point that Claudia Beamish and uh, quite a number of other members made about the uh, benefits that, that EMF funding, it used to be called something else, but that is now what it is, uh, has brought to Scotland is considerable and should not be ignored. And it will not be there after Brexit. That will be another area that will not be funded in the way in which it has uh, in the past. And I have yet to see a balance sheet which shows me wh what fund will replace that uh, in terms of the future investment in our quaysides, in our fishing uh, process, pro Processing and uh, in such uh, important infrastructure as uh, the provision of uh, fish uh, markets. Uh, the other point I went strongly agreed with Peter Chapman on was oil. Um, he's absolutely right when he says that, uh, that uh, fishing and the seafood industry more generally is, is frankly worth and will be worth uh, more than the oil and gas industry um, in the peace and over the long term. I agree with that certainly from my constituency uh, perspective and I think it is an important reflection but it only makes the case as to why uh, funds like the EMFF have been so important for uh, the future. And also can I just share the, the general view that I think quite a number of members have. I, I don't envy Donald Cameron. He's got to explain what yeah. his amendment means. Um, I hope he had to, doesn't have to spend his entire 10 minutes to explaining what his amendment means, but it wouldn't half help the Chamber if he did a bit of that uh, to, finish, uh, to finish up with. Um, on, can I just make two other points, presiding officer? Firstly, a number of members, Emma Harper and Ivan McKee, just latterly, have mentioned uh, tariffs and the importance of uh, what that might mean for the future. Now, the truth is we don't know what that might mean for the future, but we know how bad it could be, uh, and, and therefore it, that's part of those negotiations which we now know from this week uh, the UK cabinet haven't even discussed in terms of the future trade deal. So again that's not a point for Donald Cameron, it's certainly not Donald Cameron's uh, responsibility or fault but uh, d does this country need some clarity around uh, the UK government's position on these issues? They certainly do and does the fishing industry need that? Absolutely yes and not uh, and without any further uh, delay. Uh, can I just finish, uh, if I may, with uh, Stuart Stevenson's observations? He firstly set an important test. Um, I, I suspect that the industry is setting that there should be 100% control out to 200 miles. Uh, it will be interesting to see how that plays out, to use a phrase, uh, over the coming uh, weeks, months, and indeed years, whether it makes the nine-month bridge or not, uh, the transitional period, or however that shapes out. And the final observation is uh, to Mr. Stevenson, if he, if he has made 716 speeches, I am deeply impressed. I cannot say I count how many. I, I'm never going to get to the stage uh, where I count how many. But can I just wish uh, Fergus doing best wishes for the, uh, for the, uh, for the uh, council in next week and hope that he does not have to make 716 interventions during the course of that debate. Uh, thank you. I call Lewis MacDonald to close for Labour. Mr MacDonald, please. Thank you very much. And, uh, a number of members have taken the opportunity this afternoon to look backwards as well as forward, uh, Tavi Scott uh, uh, perhaps in particular. And I agree with those who have said uh, that this year's Fisheries Council 
will be historic. What I am not sure about uh, that anyone can say today is in what way it will be historic. All that is certain about Britain's future relationship with the EU is that it remains shrouded in a fog of uncertainty, which has only got denser and darker in the course of this week. What that means for the fisheries sector, like the rest of our economy, uh, is that we are on a journey to a destination as yet unknown. We now understand that the UK government has not seen fit to look into the impact of leaving the single market and customs union on any part of the economy. Bad news for our fish processors and exporters, just as much as it is for everybody else. We also know that the sail on the sea of opportunity charted by the Sc Scottish Fishermen's Federation will not be straightforward, even once the wider issues around Brexit have been settled. And so today's debate has been useful in laying out the areas which will need to be addressed next year and in 2019, and perhaps for a number of years beyond that. So tonight we will be supporting the government's motion uh, and also Tavish Scott's amendment with which we entirely agree. The Conservative amendment, I fear, remains almost as much of a mystery as Mrs May's Brexit strategy. <laughs> One thing we have all surely learned is not to assume that their purpose is actually what it seems. So in the absence of greater clarity from Mr Cameron, I fear we will not therefore be able to support Mr Chapman's amendment tonight. Reducing the impact of the landing obligation and choke species on the Scottish fleet will be important, whatever happens with Brexit. And as Rhoda Grant said, we agree with the Cabinet Secretary that the discussions need to be driven by the need to find a solution that protects both the future sustainability of fish stocks <coughs> and the commercial sustainability of the fishery sector. Indeed, seeking that balance should be the guiding light of everything we seek to do. As we have heard, a large part of the large-scale commercial fishing fleet uh, in the northeast and in Shetland uh, understands that forward planning for both whitefish and pelagic sectors has to continue to be science-based and commercially aware, while the often smaller-scale fishing sector on the west coast and in the Hebrides, uh, recognises the need for policy to protect, both to protect some fragile marine environments, but also in balance with also protecting some fragile coastal communities. Right round our coasts, that same essential balance will be required after March 2019, as it is required now, and the views and experiences of the catching sector, the fishing communities, fish farmers, fish processors must all be taken into account as well indeed as the expertise of those focused on protecting the marine environment. And we must also continue to support discussion based on evidence, scientific evidence, and it would be a mistake to assume that the hard work in matching effort and capacity to biomass and sustainability is all behind us. It would add insult to injury for those who have left the industry in the last 10 years if stocks were now to fall below sustainable levels despite the reductions that have been made in the size of the fleet. So I'm glad we've heard also about the issues facing the processing sector this afternoon. Like Stuart Stevenson, I was involved in the Fraserburgh Task Force set up after hundreds of jobs were lost at Young Seafoods in 2015. And I was pleased to hear the other day of new developments on one of the company's former sites in the town, which indeed Mr. Stevenson mentioned. As well as the impact on the local economy of the loss of so many jobs, one of the striking things about the fish processing workforce in Fraserburgh was just how international it had become. Many of those who lost their jobs were from the Baltic states or from Poland or indeed from Portugal. And many of those workers were mobile enough to find jobs quickly in other towns or even other countries. But there is no doubt that the seafood sector will be hard hit by loss of free access to EU labour. And indeed many who work on fishing vessels as well are also from out with not just uh, the UK but out with the European Union. The response to the seafood sector may be more technology and fewer workers. That's a distinct possibility and a distinct threat. That would protect the interests of those businesses, uh, but at the expense of jobs in coastal communities. And loss of free access to EU markets is also a risk for that sector too. Glib assumptions that other markets will open up instead uh, will not be of much comfort if the order books do dry up. The Scottish Fishermen's Federation is right to want to talk about what lies ahead in the post-Brexit world. All parts of the wider industry will be affected by whatever deal is done or is not done in the next few weeks and months. I said earlier that little work 
appears to have been done by, on, on economic impacts by the UK government, and that is particularly worrying for a sector such as fisheries. Uh, it, it is particularly surprising that a sector such as fisheries, whereas a number of people have commented there was support for leaving the European Union, that even a sector such as that has not been able to find uh, the U United Kingdom government taking seriously what the economic impacts will be, what the downside and the upside might be uh, of whatever happens next. And I think uh, that is a sobering thought uh, and, and a source of real concern. All the fishermen in northeast ports, and this point was made earlier, I think, by Travis Scott, still talk bitterly about having been sold out uh, at the time of the initial negotiations on joining the European community back in 1973. The problem then was that access to fishing grounds was a tradable commodity when it came to seeking the best possible deal for Britain joining Europe. Many fishermen are worried now that access to fishing grounds might still be a tradable commodity when it comes to seeking the best possible deal for leaving Europe again. They are right to be nervous at the increasing signs that UK ministers have no coherent plan or strategy for what the shape of our post-Brexit relationships might be. That lack of clear strategy seems to apply to this sector uh, as well as elsewhere. And that the apparent willingness of ministers to offer access to UK fishing grounds as an early negotiating gambit with other members of the EU. So I wish Mr Ewing every success in delivering a fair deal for Scottish fisheries in Brussels in the next few days. We also need to see a fair deal for all our communities in the Brexit negotiations in the weeks that lie ahead. Thank you, Thank you very much. Mr Macdonald, I call Donald Cameron to close for the Conservatives. Mr Cameron, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, this is my first fishing debate. I have to say, after the last two hours, I'm kind of hoping it might be my last. Um, I jest, I jest, of course. I, I'm delighted to be able to close for the, to close for the Scottish Conservatives. And as a Highlands and Islands MSP, um, with many fishing communities across the region that I represent. This is an area that I take great interest in. Um, we will be supporting the government's motion tonight, um, and uh, though not sadly the Lib Dem uh, amendment, um, but um, let me bring clarity to the um, uh, murky darkness of uh, the, the uh, amendment. The, the amendment of Peter Chapman, not myself, <laughs> says, says, Sorry, our amendment says all available, all available solutions, uh, including those of a political nature. That is a reference to the point in Peter Chapman's speech, which I'm sure everyone's listening to uh, intently, that without major uplifts in quotas for choke species in the council meeting, the discard and landing obligations will lead to restrictions. And in that scenario, what we believe is that the government must be prepared to use its political clout through negotiation in relation to choke species so fishing is not restricted or, to quote, tied to the harbour wall. So, um, as I've said, um, I also would like to wish the Cabinet Secretary luck uh, in um, um, his role in the Council meeting. And I would like to close this debate in the spirit that he opened it and not make this uh, a Brexit tit for tat. But representing the Highlands and Islands, I'm acutely aware of the importance of fishing to our local economy particularly that of the shellfish sector, which accounts for the vast majority of catches in the West Highlands and the Hebrides. And I'm aware of the multiple benefits that having a strong seafood industry has for the, the region and Scotland as a whole. We are a nation rightly famed for our fish and shellfish in the Highlands and Islands and many other seafood products. It allows excellent and renowned local businesses such as Loch Fine Oysters, the Stornoway Smokehouse and the Cranog Seafood Restaurant in Fort William to operate and flourish. And I believe that this sector can continue to expand, create new jobs and invigorate the communities that have been built around it. However, we will only get that expansion if we do secure a good Brexit deal that meets the needs of the fishing sector. And on, on market and access to market, let me take Tavish Scott's point um, straight on. I am aware, of course I am, of the need for um, our, fish, our fish and our shellfish to reach the European markets. I've stood on the pier in Oban and in Malague, and I've seen the boxes of prawns go off to Spain and France. But I'm confident that our fish and our shellfish will remain in great demand in Europe. There will still be buyers queuing up to get the top quality fish that we supply, and it should make it even more likely that we will get a comprehensive free trade deal. 
Now, whilst the outcome of the recent talks in Bergen show us... Is that, yes, of course. Tavish Scott. I'm grateful to Mr Cameron for giving way and entirely agree with the point that they'll still want our prawns and our fish. It's what they want in return for that access to the market that's in question. Well, Donald Cameron. I th thank Tavish Scott for the intervention. I'm, um, we have seen what 13 Scottish Conservative MPs have achieved in Westminster, many of them representing fishing seats. And I have no doubt that in Westminster they will stand up strongly for those communities, many of whom wanted... Uh, Brexit, many of them voted to leave the um, common fisheries policy, and I have no fear that the, our MPs will stand up for those fishing communities and will not allow them to be treated as a bargaining chip. So what the outcome of the recent talks in Bergen uh, show us is that while good progress can be made, there are also drawbacks, and uh, there's talk of the trade away of Saith or Pollock quota in the North Sea and the West of Scotland. It's one example of being forced to compete with a variety of other states who all have their own self-interests. At heart, leaving the EU and the CFP will allow us autonomy over our own waters and determine our own fishing policy, which balances sustainable fishing, and I welcome the comments that people have made about that, and also ensures the industry can remain competitive. This is not just the view of these benches, but it's the mu mood music coming from the sector and bodies that represent fishermen across Scotland. There is a great sense of optimism. The uh, SFF recently reported on data which showed that 56% of people agree that exiting the CFP will provide greater opportunities for UK fishermen. So I would suggest that notwithstanding the Cabinet Secretary's dark clouds, there are also rays of Brexit sunshine. Now, in a newspaper article earlier this year, Mike Park, the Chief Executive of the Scottish White Fish Producers Association, the SWFPA, said that securing our own waters will mean Scotland securing a far greater share of the stocks that swim in our waters and deliver greater stability for coastal communities. And he added that this would be a benefit to the engineering haulage and processing firms that often go unmentioned. Now, this undoubtedly will be a long process to get the right deal that works for the sector and the country. And it would be useful and helpful if the government worked to get a good deal overall. But I earnestly hope that achieving a good Brexit deal for Scottish fishermen does not fail. We must not allow our fishing industry to remain shackled to the common fishery policies, which has, to paraphrase the SWFPA, scarred coastal communities. Let me move on to the end-of-year negotiations in the December Council. Um, I want to turn to, to, to that matter, what it means for the, for the here and now. Acknowledging the fact that we are not leaving the European Union formally until March 2019, with most probably a period of transition thereafter, we must ensure that Scotland gets a good deal from all discussions that relate to the uh, fishing sector and we must continue to work closely with the EU and those member states who have a stake in the sector and of course non-EU nations like Iceland and Norway too. Realistically this could potentially be the last year where these pre-December talks are held which include the position of the United Kingdom and I once again welcome the generally positive agreement that resulted. What I would ask the Cabinet Secretary in his summing up to address is whether he is in favour of the nine-month bridge in 2019 suggested uh, by the um, Scottish Fishery uh, Federation. Um, we need to look to the future and plan ahead, of course, with the announcement in the last Queen's speech that the UK government will introduce a fisheries bill. This is the perfect opportunity for our colleagues in Westminster and all of us in this parliament to engage in that. We need to ensure that our industry gets the boost it deserves after years of decline, while simultaneously working with our neighbours on the continent to ensure proper parity. The bill would, could be the catalyst to reverse those lost years which, for example, has seen Scotland fall behind England in seafood processing terms, with 12% of jobs lost in Scotland compared to 10% in England. And I've heard that often enough in my own region of the Highlands and Islands, particularly when I visit places like Stornoway. In closing, um, if I could briefly um, mention um, uh, uh, the, the speeches of, of Peter Chapman and, and, Li and Liam Carr and Edward Mountain and, and others, including Claudia Beamish um, and Lewis, Lewis MacDonald, uh, both of which brought um, a very interesting perspective to this debate. Um, we welcome, uh, to conclude, presiding officer, we welcome the quota increases secured in the EU-Norway talks, and we welcome the positive news on total allowable catch and the hard work that our fishermen have put into maintaining stocks. We are mindful of the fact that we are leaving the EU in 2019, and we do have to, as the Scottish Fisheries Federation describes it, uh, take advantage of this sea of opportunity to secure a Brexit deal that works for fishing and the communities that depend on it. We all need to get behind this process, and I am confident that if we do, one of Scotland's most important sectors 
will reap those rewards for years to come. Thank you. Uh, Colin Fergus Ewing to close the Government Cabinet Secretary till five o'clock, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful to members for their support of the Scottish Government uh, and uh, my own efforts over the uh, next few days in achieving the best possible deal for Scotland. This is a traditional debate and traditionally, as uh, some of the older hands have pointed out, uh, uh, parties do join and unite in wishing well the Cabinet Secretary who has the privilege of discharging this responsibility. So I'm generally grateful for those warm wishes and the generally constructive tone of uh, the debate. Uh, and I think it's always good to hear stories and uh, anecdotes and views about uh, the fishing communities throughout the whole country from, from, uh, a, a, from Shetland down to Dumfries, as Davy Scott uh, alluded uh, to, uh, and uh, all the fishing ports on the East Coast. Um, and they make an enormous contribution to Scottish society. And they do so, as one member, Mr Kerr, suggested that, uh, pointed out, at some risk to their own life as well. It's one of the few types of job left now where there is really a very genuine risk, uh, very serious risks, and we should never forget that. And when I represented Malig uh, some time ago, I always made that point in these debates as a humble backbencher because I think we shouldn't forget it. And also, uh, as it happens, I, also, I had the pleasure of opening the, the uh, new distribution uh, and administration centre of Aldi's in Bathgate serving Scotland. And I learned from them that actually consumption of fish is growing in comparison to meat, both uh, sea fish and farm fish. As more people see the benefits, uh, the, the, uh, the obvious, uh, a, a, a enjoyment, but also the nutritious benefits of uh, fish, not that uh, have anything against uh, a meat as a hardened, a committed carnivore, but uh, more and more people are enjoying our fish and our shellfish, uh, and increasingly that's the case all over the world. And part of it, to take Claudia Beamish's point, uh, is uh, at the, the gathering in Glen Eagles of buyers from all over the world, and companies from Scotland, 150 of each, Many buyers from places like Singapore made the point that the provenance of Scotland's clean green image is increasingly important for retailer purchase, uh, and we shouldn't forget that either. And that's why I was pleased to confirm that fishing must be sustainable, and I wanted to address in responding to the points raised in this debate, and some of them are about Brexit, and I, I will try and address those, although they're not the primary purpose of this debate, and I should make that clear. Um, but I think I should say in response to Mr. Ruskell that you know, we are committed to sustainable fishing. And that means respecting the science. I would point out that I mean, science is, uh, the scientific evidence is about what's happening beneath the sea, the surface of the sea. Uh, and it is open to debate and question. And it's a legitimate area for discussion. Uh, but nonetheless, as in principle, of course, we accept the science. And we should recognize at the same time the efforts that uh, uh, the fishing sector have made themselves in the cod recovery plan, for example. There was a, a headline in a newspaper that there were only a thousand cod left in the North Sea. Well, what rubbish that proved to be. Uh, the fishermen, as Mr. Stevenson mentioned, uh, as uh, having direct interest in conservation, helped to deliver that plan. And I think sometimes it's right to point out that they should get the credit for that. Um, but the choke, choke species, and I think Tavi Scott had an excellent speech, uh, a, less pressured and stressful than perhaps some of those that he had to make over the years, and I won't go into all that, but uh, he and I know exactly what uh, I mean. He made an excellent speech, and, and he pointed out that if you'd have a TACs and a discard ban, that does lead to pressures. But what I would say in response to Mr. Cameron is that, you know, I don't think that the use of the word political is helpful in this debate. We, we cannot support the amendment. I mean, we could support it in the sense it's ambiguous because it doesn't really have a clear meaning at all. And therefore, if it is part of the motion that's accepted, it really can mean anything one wishes it to mean. But I think the reality is that what it means is that acting in an extra legal way and moving away to bad practices, I think that's how it's perceived. And I don't think that's the correct approach we should take. And incidentally, I know that it is not the approach that the UK government will take at all. Uh, so it is, in that sense, academic. But I do want to say, in respect of the choke species, that as well as setting TACs, which take account of current discard levels, and, for example, the discard levels of cod are thought to be around 1,200 tonnes, so that would take care of that if that could be achieved. 
as well as that, there are a whole plethora, which Mr. Cameron didn't mention, uh, although perhaps he didn't have time, but there are a whole plethora of other measures. For example, in the west of Scotland, whiting choke species selectivity measures might be a solution. In respect of North Sea ling, uh, a potential choke risk, uh, inter-area flexibility, having the, the TACs and quotas applying across differing areas uh, of the North Sea can give the flexibility to remove the choke problem. Now, I don't know if there's a, a sustained appetite for another five minutes or so of discourse on the choke species, but I know that Mr. Mr. Scott is nodding, so, so I've, I've reached the, the, the most intelligent electorate here for the fishing. <laughs> Apart from Mr. Stevenson, of course, I should mention quickly. Um, so I think it's correct to say we will not be supporting the Tory amendment. I think it would send out a wrong signal that we're moving away from the principles which the public expect us to observe of sustainable fishing, using all the available technology, and I confirm that that's something that we support, uh, and I think we will develop the use of that as time goes on. And I wanted to make that assurance quite clear, because I know the Greens have a particular interest in that, and rightly so. But many members have mentioned the problems associated with Brexit. Mr. McKee mentioned the just the, the maintenance of processing and the numbers of people from EU countries. And like in so many other areas of the rural economy, it's difficult to see how processing operations can continue without the labour of those who choose to give the benefits of their working lives to Scotland and Scottish industries. Uh, and in respect of trade, many members made uh, points about the importance of uh, trade. I think Rhoda Grant, uh, certainly Stuart Stevenson, Angus MacDonald referred to the importance of trade and obviously the European market is the largest overseas market. And as far as the Brexit opportunities, you know, it's not clear to me, presiding officer, what export market is not currently accessible. You know, what new markets are inaccessible to us at the moment? There aren't any. But, but, if we are subject to WTO, then the tariffs that the industry will face would be 7% uh, or perhaps up to double that, adding, I understand, around 41 million to the tax burden as a direct Brexit cost. And therefore, that surely is something that we should all say is a very bad idea. Um, I was also asked by Claudia Beamish if I could respond about what we've done at EMF. I'm happy to do so. Uh, the EMF, as Mr. Stevenson says, contributes uh, around £80 million, 107 euro, million euros to Scotland. And incidentally, our share is not as much as it should be in, out of the total. Uh, but that money has provided enormous benefits. And I've seen around Fraser Borough, Peter Head, Scrabster, improving harbours, improving processing facilities, enabling processing plants to up their game to be more competitive. Uh, uh, and there, thereby operate more successfully and help to pay their staff a decent, uh, decent remuneration. So this has been invaluable. Now, it's secure up to 2020, but thereafter, we don't know. And I, I can tell you directly that I did ask Mr. Gove uh, when I met him last, will you replace the EMF post-Brexit? Answer come, came there, none. We simply have no idea on that or indeed on any other substantive issue what the UK are saying should happen post-Brexit. And that, I think, convener, is unfortunate. But on a consensual note, I'm very grateful for the support of all members and I undertake to do everything I can to get the best possible deal for Scotland's fishing communities uh, throughout Scotland over the coming days. Thank you very much. That concludes our debate on sea fisheries and NGO negotiations. We turn straight to decision time, and the first question is that Amendment 9406.2 in the name of Peter Chapman, which seeks to amend Motion 9406 in the name of Fergus Ewing on sea fisheries and NGO negotiations, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote, and members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment 9406.2 in the name of Peter Chapman is yes 28, no 57. There were 14 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that Amendment 9406.1 in the name of Tavish Scott, who seeks to amend the motion in the name of, the of Fergus Ewing, is agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 9406.1 in the name of Tavish Scott is yes 71, no 28. The amendment is agreed. And the final question is that motion 9406 in the name of Fergus Ewing as amended on sea fisheries and end year negotiations be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members will cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 9406 in the name of Fergus Ewing as amended is yes 70, no 29, there were no abstentions, the motion as amended is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.